guys how are you doing everyone's doing a thumbs up oh. <laughs> no i mean i'm i'm saying it because some people don't watch this so they have to know hi guys welcome to chart where we chat about art today we'll be talking about m green and drag sets prada martha we are finn mara javier and christy and thank you for tuning in to listen to chart podcast we are so stoked to have you here with us and let you take some time out of your day to hear us discuss any things that are happening in the art world. Without further ado, let's jump into the episode. Let's roll. Where's Martha? Martha is near Texas. It's in Texas. Why am I saying near? About, being near Texas would mean it's somewhere else. <laughs> um, geography is not everyone's strong suit. They sort of started having the idea of using the Prada star as a way to criticize gentrification in New York. So Should we define what gentrification means? So it's kind of like when there's a neighborhood and the city decided to like develop it or like private property. Yeah, try to like do it up, like just increase it as the land prices and the housing prices. Or you can also say when individually owned shops are being gentrified by chains. For example, nicely sourced coffee place compared to a Pret. Everyone likes Pret. Well, I don't like their <laughs> coffee. Like, why wouldn't you want to go to Pret where they sometimes give you a free coffee if you make friends with them? But I don't like their coffee. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And their sandwiches are... Uh. I don't mind... I don't eat the food there. Wow. I I'm like their picky. food. Their food is I like good. their um, croissant sandwiches. I like their food. Where I live, we have loads of independent coffee shops. I always prefer their coffee. Like, taste-wise, yeah. it's bomb.com. We're getting sidetracked. I'm Again. sorry. I just... Sorry. The coffee is not... local. <laughs> um, so... In 2001, uh, Prada opened a store in Guggenheim's ground floor space. Yeah, so, so that they're kind of trying to comment on it. And they also had a show at Tanya Banagar Gallery. And it's kind of like behind this alleyway. They've put a Prada opening soon. And it kind of like covered the space. So no one really know that you can go in. It's actually like a show, but um, a lot of people didn't even realize. And because it says opening soon, people were so used to gentrification that they just called up and say like, oh, who's the designer of the shop? Instead right. of, or, or people calling the, the gallery saying like, oh, I'm so sorry that you're closing down, uh, which is quite interesting, like how immune we are to sad things. Yeah, so, so they did that in 2001. And in 2005, they built a fake Prada shop where you can't really enter in 34 miles away from Marfa. It's actually quite interesting how they took the name Marfa because they're actually just, I think, like one or two miles away from another town called Valentin. But then they, they called it Marfa because they wanted to respond to how Marfa was also being gentrified because of the Donald Judd Foundation. Yeah, yeah. also Marfa in... Romanian, maybe other Romance languages, is what you say like a shop has. So the stock that they have is called Marfa. I thought that that was why at the beginning I didn't realise it was next to Marfa. I thought it was called that because it was maybe the Italian for what a shop has inside. But like, yeah. like if you leave the shop and you've got a banging outfit, you say like, oh, I love their Marfa. Oh. Maybe it's a nice coincidence or maybe they knew. They're... Danish and Swedish. Green and Drax, they used to be a couple and they started working in 1998. Until they broke up? Huh? Yeah, they broke up. They're like, so upset about the breakup. They broke up. They broke up in 2004. But then they still worked together as an artist duo. That's what people call them now. Yes, when you begin to believe in love. <laughs> were they your life? They were my, my model relationship, yes. It was like nine years. So that's yeah. like pretty solid. When they first started out, they did a lot of works about um, homosexuality, which is very interesting as well, worth looking into. So what they had was the fall and winter collection, I think, of Prada. The, the storefront is sealed shut and they wanted the work to succumb to its elements. It was supposed to be romantic, poetic, but then I think in two days someone vandalized it. 
and like broke into it, took all the Prada stuff out. Was it authentic Prada stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were donated by Prada as well. Just to like understand, it's a Prada shop in the middle of a of nothing. It's literally yeah. in the of nowhere, a highway, yeah. and it looks exactly like a Prada shop, but you just can't go inside. It doesn't really look like a traditional Prada store. You can you just have the windows where you can see the handbag standing there, and three rows of right shoe, and it's all size thirty seven that you see and then three handbags on either side. There is no photographs or anything inside or lights or you just see the product. Still, they broke the windows and looted the, the content. Yeah, so people like broke into it, their idea of, you know, it's succumbing to its elements right. doesn't really work because like they quickly fixed it and then they, they've cut holes in their Prada items and uh, the people who vandalized it spray paint like dumb and dumb dumb on the sides and yeah, it was quite funny. What do you guys think? Um, I've seen it in loads of Instagram pictures. People travel to it just to take a picture in front yeah. of it. If you ever happen to be in Marfa in Texas in the middle of nowhere, it's worth checking out. I'd love to see it though. Let's take a trip to Marfa. Hey, if we get 100,000 likes, we're going to Prada Marfa. <laughs> I think we, we like, need money. <laughs> Donate to Algo no, We just need the likes, Mara. Trust me. Oh, wow. He knows Javier it. will pay for the trip. Yes, I will pay. If we get 100,000 likes, I will pay for the trip. About the work, though, being serious, I think it only gets better after people vandalize it. If you had been, like, pristinely there for this all this time and nobody had paid attention to it, I don't think it would have worked as well as it did. Yeah. I think it encapsulates what public art is about. The fact that people can interact with it or they decided to interact with it because you wanted this work to be exposed to outside elements and has been by humans and and like a lot of their works is about being immersive and putting you in different situations and make you feel a bit displaced and i feel like people reacting to it because there's not that construct of a gallery space mm -hmm. that you have to like behave a certain way that people think that you're you're on like a middle of a highway and like no one cares no one can see you what you're doing and there's the idea of how do people behave when they're not being watched. It's kind of like when you walk into a gallery space and you feel like you have to like stand in front of a work and contemplate, pretend that you're actually thinking while in your head, you're just like, this looks like shit or pretty. <laughs> it provokes people to do things. I think that should be made a distinction between interacting with a piece of art and vandalizing it, especially when we talk about public art. But that Anish Kapoor sculpture- it's Known as the bean. But the point is that one thing is like, when you go there, everybody's taking pictures and leaning on it, climbing on it and all that. That is interacting with it because you're not actually destroying it. A, a different thing is when you go to Prada Marfa and you loot the, the things inside and you break the windows and you write on it. That is, that is vandalizing. That's like breaking it, even if it worked like in favor of the meaning of the artwork. Yeah. Well, I don't think it necessarily works in favor of the artwork in a way that the artist has intended it to be. I'm pretty sure they contemplated the possibility possibly because in 2013 someone vandalized it again and they were like proper upset what i really like about the work is that it, it will have small maintaining tasks like mm -hmm. go and check that the door is still locked or stuff like that in years time it will become a ruin uh, if you could go there in like let's say 20 years that it's it acts like a reflection of the time that when it was built how funny would it be though? Imagine there's like a cataclysm in the next 10 years or something. All of us become extinct and then aliens come, I don't know, like a thousand years later and they find like this thing in the middle of the desert. And they're like, what was wrong with this civilization? What is the meaning of this? Um, do you know what I think is cool is that when they made it in 2005, in my mind, this work is like, I only knew it visually from social media and then later found out it was an artwork. I thought honestly they had built a Prada store in the middle story. of nowhere as a lol because they knew it would get like a lot of people coming because it's mm -hmm. a bit weird but mm -hmm. how many visitors did they have in the first few years loads of artworks are those things they know what they're doing and they make it so that people go want to take a picture with it it goes on social media then the artist is like more and more well known i'm sure if you're in this in the area you would i mean like a lot of people in the states they do love driving across driving <laughs> across <laughs> What are we doing this weekend? We're just driving, driving across. across state lines or whatever. Yeah. yeah, we're going to go to this Prada store in the middle of nowhere. Oh, great. 
I think I would be more intrigued if somebody would ask me, would you like to see the bean in Chicago? Or would you like to see the Prada Marfa store in the middle of the desert near a highway? I would be way more intrigued to say, okay, why on earth is there a Prada store? I think there's definitely an element of intriguing factor when you have something in a place you don't expect it to be. Mm. If, you, if you do that, like, just go to this museum in New York. You kind of expect New York to be full of museums. If you go to see this one thing in the middle of nowhere, you are excited to go to the middle of nowhere to find something. I think it's kind of like the idea of a spectacle. Mm -hmm. Like you don't expect something interesting or man-made. Well, technically the fucking highway is man-made, but you know, you would expect just absolutely nothing on a highway. It's literally the contrast between something so pristine and expensive and luxurious. And it's not a wasteland. It's just, there's nothing there. Yeah. Like, what do you call that? Like, it's desert. It's just... The waste, I like the word wasteland. Max. It has this Mad Max vibe I like. Yeah. On top of that, I think we're on a level of the Anthropocene where, like, things like a road or... What does that mean? The I don't even the Anthropocene, know, I can't... The anthropological period where the man has spread to an extent on Earth and has manipulated it, the entire landscape is shaped by human beings. There's no longer any corner of earth where there's like wilderness and we don't know what's happening and it's yet to be explored and all that. Every single landscape in every country you can visit, or at least in the 99% of countries you can visit, has been in a way or another shaped by men. Yeah. Antarctica is bare as I wouldn't say 99%. Okay, fine. I was once in a, in a lecture by a guy who was going to visit Antarctica. He kept saying a lot of things about how you were absolutely forbidden from changing. Like you couldn't pee outside of the house. You couldn't because yeah. you would alter the Antar Antarctica. So I think okay. Antarctica is the exception that confirms the rule. Like it's the one yeah. place on earth where they're like, you cannot touch anything. This is the one place we have where we haven't actually messed it up. <laughs> fly two times a week from South Africa to Antarctica. It's a, a commercial plane. I mean, you can like do tours in there. So this is some ice. And here's some more ice. If, Let's go back. That is another thing of capitalism. If you have the money, you can do anything. I think we're drifting very Any, yeah. Wait, yeah, back to the work. Is yeah, it back. a comment on consumerism? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're kind of talking about consumerism as well with Antarctica. Yeah. What I wanted to say is that you would perceive the highway as part of that nothing. Okay. If I was driving down there and I saw the Prada Marfa, I wouldn't think, oh, that's a second thing here. I would be like, there was nothing here and suddenly Prada Marfa. So I think that's why it works so well, because it's something so unexpected and so out of place that it completely stands out. How would you describe the work? In, is it like a land art piece or is it? It's like a, pop art. Pop art. Maybe like, a, like that, isn't it? Like it's something you link with consumerism, something a bit weird, something that's like you want to look at. Maybe. I'm not saying it is pop art, it is by Andy Warhol. I mean like it's... You're implying all pop art is Andy Warhol. It's using some, sorry, it's using something which everyone recognizes right. as a consumer or fine they're putting it in a bit of a weird place but it's that idea of using something so recognizable to everyone but then capitalist realism also does the same thing yeah what is well, that uh, capitalist realism uh, i think we touched on it before like sigma poker gerard richter like these people that were in Düsseldorf when they studied there um, under Josef Beuys. They started capitalist realism to move away from pop art. They basically wanted to render mass-produced things unique. And also it was kind of like a diss on socialist realism, which is this so Soviet propaganda art. They kind of started doing that in like mid-60s when pop art was already there. On top of all that, it's funny because I would say Prada Marfa is like a relational art it's not only about what it is, it's about people who visit it and are attracted by it, the way a gentrification device should work. Is it even a sculpture? Is it an installation? I think it's really interesting how they incorporate viewers like us, but also the environment as collaborators of the work. So we all kind of contribute to it. Us having an opinion or doing something in front of it or to it becomes a part of the work. The weathering of the work, the, the nature also contributes to forming the work even more as they said succumbed to its elements because they used apparently biodegradable materials to, to build it. Oh, mm. that's so cool. I yeah, I'm, I'm really unsure about like, what about the product goods? Cause I don't think they're biodegradable. But you have to have Prada stuff because otherwise what's the point of the artwork? I think it's interesting that we are all having this discussion about what kind of artwork it is. And because it's an example of how when you talk about art, 
especially contemporary art, you're kind of imposing terms on it. It's trying to categorize it and put it in a box. And at the same time, the point of the artist is to break that box and do something new. Yeah. So here's the friction between people who study arts and people who make the arts. Did they make anything after this that was Prado related? This was one of the first works that they did that is related to Prada. And then they were just curators for the Nordic and the Danish pavilion in 2009. It was like one of the most iconic bit of the death of the collector work. There's a pool outside with a fake dead body of a collector supposedly floating um, in the swimming pool. And then there's a pair of Prada shoes. These two pavilions are right next to each other. And they're kind of supposed to act as neighbors in like a really nice neighborhood because the whole Giardini is quite like fancy. Check out our Biennale episode to know what yeah. we're talking about. You, and then you know what's a Biennale, what's a the Giardini, Giardini so what's yes. Arsenale, um, how the space looks like. And obviously you can also Google it. Yeah, and then they, they put out signs outside saying for sale. And they had actors or performers um, outside early in the morning where they would take you around uh, on a tour around the house. And uh, they decorated in a way that it does look like a really modern home of like a collector. And they put in um, works of other artists in the space. So it's kind of like really quirky. Yeah, I remember I went one time uh, to the Venice Biennale and that was that year, 2009, but I didn't. I can remember, so I was 12 then. Dead. Your parents took you to Biennale when you were 12. Wow. But I don't remember anything else or other pavilions. Yeah. I didn't even know what pavilions were. I was just there. It was really hot. A lot of tourists. But I remember seeing the dead body floating and then the pair of shoes and that pool is situated right besides very, very small and high stairs, like a, a stairway. Yeah. And standing on top would be like... Did he jump from here? But his shoes are there. It doesn't make any sense. He's still wearing his watch. It's such a shallow pool. So yeah. you had already like read Sherlock Holmes or something because you were very detective esque for a 12 year old. Yeah. I had like a sugar rush because no. I just ate ice cream or something. It was a very surreal experience seeing body floating there. I guess we also need to address why did they choose Prada? Uh, apparently, it's kind of like a preferred. Um, art gallery art world type of apparel because it's really minimalist seem to be like really sleek so a lot of people choose to wear prada in the art world as like a if you will a uniform because when you look at their fashion shows if you look at chanel's fashion shows they are really expressive and they are working with different artists to create the the scene of their fashion show i think their latest one was at the well anyway it was in paris in the big glass I cannot remember the name. Dom, Dom? Yeah, Glass Dom. Dom, Dom, Dom. <laughs> it was this huge installation where they made a forest indoors with uh, projector screens and it was this beautiful thing. And Prada is more like sleek and yeah. black and white. white it's cafe. very white cube. Very white cube. Yeah. Very white cube. What is a white cube, people? Why do we use the term? So white cube is how you usually refer to the gallery space in contemporary art. So it interferes at least with what an artwork might do in, if you hang it from the wall or if you put it in the middle. It's the most neutral space that you can have for contemporary art to happen. Christy? Right. But then there's also a debate around whether putting work in a complete white cube space, would that take away what it's supposed to respond to? You know, well, that yeah, sounds like feel... a great topic for an episode yeah. in the future. I mean, we can talk about all the theories about White Cube and everything that's against it because um, Elm Green Drag said it's also really interesting right. in that idea of a White Cube. So they've done a lot of, um, they've got a series called Powerless Structures. They kind of take form in different ways as sculptures, as a complete installation. There's a few in particular where they transformed the idea of a gallery space. So there's the dug down gallery space where they've dug a hole in the ground and then it's also outdoors. And then you, you look at it and it's just like a white space with like some chairs. And there's another one in Portcus in Frankfurt. Yeah, so instead of a normal space, they've put like a wave on the floor. So the floor um, is wavy. It's kind of like a, a ramp. Yeah, and the, and the ceiling is also like concave. So it's like, whoop. 
Were you able to walk on it though? I don't remember. Yeah, That's a can. great way to visualize yeah. it. It's just like a critique on like that very boring, you know, concrete floor, white walls yeah. and ceilings, that kind of thing. I'm going back to the part of my Why yeah. does it feel a bit like obnoxious? It feels yeah. like the collaboration that literally Truly, Prada in the name does most of the work for them anyway, you know, in that artwork. Mm, maybe it was an intentional reference to the commodification of contemporary art. Contemporary art has expanded to such an extent as a market that now it feels like it's no longer a thing that artists make for the, for the insecurities and to get a point across. It's more of a commercial thing that you know, make so you, because you know it has an impact that will uh, attract people willing to invest in it and buy it. Capitalism corrupts everything in this life, and art is one of those well, things. Given that art is quite elitist still, and people who normally have the money or care for art, those people would be the ones who are exposed to these artworks. Luxurious brand, they also have collaborations with artists to promote their brand. It's a cultural, lifestyle, luxurious thing. Like, it's still very bourgeoisie, if you will. Indeed. I love that. You make products for a purpose. And then here, they have a collaboration where Prada, these shoes and these handbags for free, and they just yeah. stand there. They have no purpose anymore. It is dangerous to say that, Finn. It's not that they're giving them for free. It's exposure, adding to the mystique of Prada as a brand. I mean, that work, I very, very often have seen in people's houses or being sold as individual works because I think even if you don't know that it's its own sculpture or installation and you see that picture you're like that's so yeah like I can't remember who said earlier it creates intrigue it's a bit like what is that yeah I feel like they're riding off the back of like how famous or how known the brand is because if it was another shop if it was top shop and you saw it that picture prepped. if it was no, pre I, I, I'd like it. If it was like Top Shop or something, you'd be like, okay. Which again brings us back to the idea of a spectacle. Performativity of that structure itself, but at the same time, the performativity of nature and of humans. The last kind of vandalism that happened there, I think it was. It was 2014. The walls, the side walls were completely painted blue and then they put huge um, logos of Tom's shoes oh. covering the Prada logo. I don't know what they did with that. Did they um, take it off or is it still? Yeah, they took all of it off because it was actually done by an artist called Joe Magneno. It was like a Texan artist. And what he wanted to do was that, like, so he transformed it into Tom's. So Tom's, you know, like the brand, they're supposed to be like sustainable. They, they say that they're going to donate a pair of shoes to a third a world country yeah. um, if you buy a pair. And apparently there were like some controversies around Tom during that time. So he used that space as like a way to protest and he left like a manifesto outside um, chained to a box of glitter toms as well he really turned up with a plan it was like incredibly intentional and uh i'm going drugs like they were really upset about it they felt like he shouldn't have used their work to gain exposure as funny because yeah. that's what prada is doing with their work and what they're doing with prada so does but, this work not lose meaning though like being the guy or the work which vandalizes the prada marfa don't you just, oh, he vandalized it rather than he had an important message about what Tom's was doing. It's like if I threw a piece of meat at the Mona Lisa and I was like, I'm throwing meat because I hate people who eat meat. We should all be vegetarians. Yeah. And then people will be like, she's that woman or that's yeah. the thing that happened to the Mona Lisa. They're not going to be like, it's because we should all think about how much meat we consume yeah. and all of that. Yeah. Right. In the, the meaning just gets lost in like how important the first artwork is regarding. Yeah, it, it kind of becomes about a person through meat at Mona Lisa instead of it's actually <laughs> about, it, I think you can feed like the whole world if you use all the energy that we use on, you know, farming animals. 
just on farming plants. It also kind of just shows the idea of boundaries that we now have, but also what people would do in order to get their point across. The desire to show what you're trying to say is bigger than the respect yeah. that you should be giving. But to be honest, I think artists are constantly jumping on each other's work to make create a dialogue. I can think of a lot of examples where someone did something and another artist did something about I, it. Thing. You know what it makes me think of? I love Josie Yemen, but her bed. Yeah, it's been jumped on. Yeah, right. where people literally went and jumped on it and then they were like, why? There were two Chinese satire artists who just decided to jump on it for the longs. One of them, by the way, was the husband of a professor of ours. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, I did think like, oh, there's a link, but I can't remember who. Yeah, I remember. It just came back to me, that memory. Also, the, the, the famous, or infamous actually, banana that this artist strapped to the wall. He was also a performance artist, but I forgot who yeah, was Yeah, like some of the artists came and ate the banana. Yeah. So there you go. I think it's a Russian roulette yeah. thing where like, you, like artists take the risk. And yeah. sometimes the other artists like, this is great. Sometimes the previous artist is like, this is horrendous. We're going to tap into the idea of, is there a hierarchy between artists and, you know, the recognition and how do you define a successful artist? But then also because this guy, Joe from Texas, he's not necessarily like a very Joe. well-known artist compared to, you know, Elm Green and Draxit. So right. um, Elm and Draxit felt like he was like attacking their work. I don't really know how to think about Elm Green and Draxit's reaction towards it. I think it's really interesting how people react to the work. The fact that they were very angry at Joe from Texas. Um, <laughs> Joe from Texas. Can we call him that from now on? Texas Joe. Yeah. Completely ruined his reputation as an artist. Have everybody call him Texas <laughs> Joe. Can, then again, can you call it a vandalism? Because he reacts on a, the Elm Green and Draxit work, which is supposed to be public. The whole idea, I think, of the uh, Prada Marfa work is also that it should become one with the surroundings and everything that happens to the the work just happens because I, I read an interview about it you know it has to start living its own life now so if if uh, people will use it as a shooting range and it will get bullet holes or if animals will use it for shelter then that will become its new life but then when another artist joe from texas texas joe reacts spray paints the walls blue and makes it tom's then they're like no we have to clean it up again and yeah. make I think they should have left it vandalized. Mm. At this very moment, is it vandalized in some way or is it in its pristine form? Apparently. Well, we'll have to get that. Oh yeah, 100,000. So we're never going. One day, 10 years from now, we're going to realize, f we have to go. Uh, no, you're going to realize, f I said I'd pay. <laughs> right. Is it a depth of amazingness and messages you try and understand and all that? Not really. It's sort of just appealing has a few bits and pieces to say, has been vandalized a few times. I would actually completely disagree with you, Mara. I would say it is not an artwork that is meant to be appealing. It's a, about having a discussion of what it, of what it means. Mm. Although, okay, granted, it's pretty on its own because it's a Prada nice little store. But I think what's beautiful about this artwork is not what it looks like, it's what conversation you can have about it. It made just like a regular fence placed it behind the building to kind of fence off the building from kind of the desert so that the building and the Prada Marfa is yeah. uh, connected to the highway. Mm -hmm. Now people are using it to uh, those, those key locks where they put their name on them. Are you joking? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Honestly. Are you joking right now? Are they actually? They are on there. So that makes me angry. That you would go, it's not something you would come across like every day. Maybe if you drive you know, across states on the weekend. People intentionally go to the Prada Marfa and then think, oh, I'm going to take a padlock with me, write my name and the one... And my, and my boyfriend's name. A few people do it, right? Like they just happen to have a, a lock with them and wrote their names and... No one it from happens there. to have a lock. Well, no it has one to start, happens. Well, it, even if it, had, if it didn't, if it wasn't by chance, someone did it. But at, the, at some point, it becomes the reason why people do that. Like, it's not like you go there, oh no, by the way, we're going to hang this thing. It's like, I'm pretty sure a lot of people now go to the Paramarfa to hang the bad luck thingy with their names. And then on top of that, the part of the experience is watching the Paramarfa. In a very romantic point of view, uh -huh. because oh. the work is supposed to be, you know, succumb to its elements, it's kind of like the same with people's relationships. Oh, Chrissy, oh. I... 
That uh, that was deep. That hurt me. Hashtag deep. Yes. <laughs> Profoundness. You're so fucking pathetic and banal. <laughs> <you> hashtag it. <laughs> yes. If you do this, unsubscribe, please. I can unsubscribe. Leave you, us alone. We don't no, want you we're, here. We're inclusive. Okay, we love fine. everyone. Don't tweet us anything romantic. This is it. Like, thank you for coming. We love you. Subscribe. Leave a I comment. Can subscribe. Um, and please leave a review. Five Yay. stars would be amazing. Do not be honest in the reviews. Just be positive. <laughs> and, and remember, a hundred thousand likes, and we go to Paramarfa. And Mara is paying. Yeah. I'm not. I do not have enough money. I'm a shop assist. Can I spend my money the way I want to spend it? Yeah, you can take us to Paramarfa. Yes. No, I don't Haircut. have enough money to get us there. Leather. You just have to renounce to five haircuts. I think you can take us there. Yeah. Um, Maybe not bring us back, but we can figure that out once we're there. Oh my god, I hate people who say bring me back. What do you mean? Like, you know, when people post like... Oh, take no, me no, back. Not oh, bring take me, like, take take me, me back. back. Yeah, take me like, back. Oh, I hate every that. Single time I, see it, I cringe so hard, I want to throw up. I see so many pictures of like girls at, like, at the beach or something, and I'll be like, clearly that's not now. And they'll be like, take me back. I love, like, summer's amazing. Like, when they're traveling. Please, get, can we go can back? I'll take me back. No one's gonna... F- Take you back. You pay your own fucking money to go there. What the fuck up? This is the conclusion I... to the episode. Thank you for watching. <laughs> no one's gonna fucking take you back, apart from yourself. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. If you especially loved our episode, we would love it if you gave it a 5 star rating and a review and even consider taking a screenshot of this episode and posting it on your Instagram stories. That way we know that you love it and other people can find our podcast as well. If you're not subscribed yet, again, what are you doing? Subscribe and get notified every time we publish a new episode. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Chart Podcast. And if you want to see our faces while we talk, find us on YouTube at Chart Podcast as well. We are Chart and we'll hope we'll meet you again at some point in the near future. Take care. Chart out. Yeah. I cannot see him, but Dude, I can you just trust me there's a man there? Okay, fine. Oh, I missed it. <laughs> no, just trust me, there's a man there. Tim saw it. That's all that matters. Love you. See you. Love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.